I'm Michael E. Ferkins, and you're listening and watch Linea Rock. Hi, Mr. Ferkins, Michael Lee Ferkins. Welcome to Italy and welcome to Linear Rock. Thank you. Our Thank you. pleasure to yeah. have you here. Oh, my pleasure. So, class of 67, and you're active as a musician since 1985, and you've been one of the first guitar players to mix bluegrass, country blues, jazz with rock. How did it happen for you? Which was your first love? Oh, of course, rock and roll. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But my, my father liked uh, a little bit of country and Elvis Presley and all those kind of things. So he he showed me um, some country artists, mostly guitarists. and uh, But I was heavily into rock and roll. So I only listened a little bit to what he was saying. But later on, and I got more into it, and probably when I was about 20 years old, then I started uh incorporating different styles with rock and just experimenting yeah. so it was just natural i mean or uh, it was conceived some way or did you listen to something that inspired you to do you know this mixture probably leonard skinnard is kind of a you know the country has uh, country influences in their rock and roll and a lot of rock and roll has uh, a little bit of country from way back in it so i think it is a natural progression to to mix country with rock because of just basic rock and roll, you know? So you're noted amongst, you know, guitarists in rock and not only rock for your prolific use of the hybrid picking uh, at high speeds. Uh, can you explain this technique and what originally and still fascinates you about it? Oh, well, I just, yeah, anything that's uh, progressive and uh you know, bluegrass, they're very amazing players. And uh, so I've tried all the different picking techniques over the years. And uh, a lot of it comes from just traditional country guys. But, uh, you know, when you play it a little bit faster or a little bit uh, with a rock and roll sound, um, and you, you know, you're using your fingers and a pick sometimes. And it's just uh, it's something I've been doing for probably, I'd say, 20 years. Uh, maybe more, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's just one of the techniques, you know, that I use sometimes. And a little after Malmsteen, Satriani and Vi, you emerged in the shred trend of the early 90s, along with Paul Gilbert, Vinnie Moore, Richie Kotzen. Uh, but actually you won, you know, the best guitarist of the year in a lot of guitar magazines, even before them all and more. Um, Despite, you know, the commercial success you all had, you were in a favorite position. Um, you've also won the Edison Award, yeah, which is the Dutch version of the Grammy. Yep. And uh, just I wanted to ask you, you know, can all those awards and recognitions uh, really make the difference for an artist like you? You, you we're all discussing in these days, you know, about Deep Purple that were inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame very late. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, everybody's talking about this thing, about awards and recognition that sometimes are far, you know, from the reality, from the value of real artists. So, which is your point of view on this matter? I'm not very impressed with awards. <laughs> so, you know, it's fun for about one day. You know, you wake up, someone says, hey, you won an award. And, oh, good, I think I'll go out to lunch today. <laughs> and and it's fun. You know, you feel good for one day. You know, maybe you have a vacation for a day, and then it's back to work the next day, you know. Um, so I maybe didn't enjoy those things as much as I, I could have. But, uh, again, I don't think it's, you know, I appreciate the people who give them to me, but I just keep working every day. So, um, it's all about the music and, and how happy you are inside. I mean, it's, that's really what it's about. So, Did they happen some way, you know, to, to help your success? Because, you know, the name was I don't going think around. So. I don't think it helped yeah. because I think the music biz changes so quickly. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's, you just, uh, you never know what's about to happen next. And, uh, you know, the internet didn't even exist when I started making records, so everything changes every five years, yeah. uh, if not sooner. So, and uh, 
Concerning the internet, you stated recently um, that iTunes and Spotify and all the web stuff are devalued music, and yeah. which is quite a strong statement nowadays. Yeah, yeah. So you're really convinced about it. You you don't see well, any positive, you know, thing about it. I don't. No, no. I, I think that uh, they don't pay. That's <laughs> a big problem, and uh, and it, it's not so much that I. I'm mad that I'm not getting paid. I just don't like to see greedy people steal money. Okay. That's why I'm fine. My life is fine. I don't. I don't uh, cry over. Uh, oh, I didn't get the five dollars from iTunes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know. So it's more about you know just all these people. They're billionaires to start with, so they come and start companies that you can't stop. And so, uh, but I, I won't be putting my music on iTunes any longer or any of that. No. So it's just cons and no pros for you in, I think in so. the web stuff. Yeah, they don't, uh, you know, it doesn't, the, I won't miss anything by not being on iTunes. Right. I won't miss a thing. <laughs> so going back uh, to your influences, you know, while other guitar players that we already mentioned, Paul Gilbert, Winnie Moore, among others, uh, they were more into the classical music. Uh, you followed the lesson of Chet Atkins, Albert Lee, with the Van Halen language at, yes. at the beginning, yep. m maybe more than now, as a base of your style. Um, yep. Why that? I mean, you were very different, you know, than everybody else. Was that, again, something natural that came? Mostly, but there was a percentage of that where you say, okay, uh, I want to have my own style. How am I going to do that? So I would find the little things that were unique, and then I would do more of them. And yeah, I do remember when Ingve came out, everyone, I was traveling around, I'd go to every music store and there'd be people playing Ingve, you know, very badly, you yeah. know. And, and so um, I said, you know, I don't want to be in this standing in line for this. So I just stopped, you know, and I did like Ingve, but I really liked Randy Rhodes. And that's where the classical stuff uh, was influential to me, plus my mother's piano playing. But uh, I love Van Halen, so it's not that's not hard to go to. <laughs> yeah. So you just mentioned your mom, and also your dad was a musician. So your dad was a guitarist, and your mom was a pianist. Yeah. Uh, but you choose the guitar. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, at age eight, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Did you think back then that the guitar was more a man's world than the piano, or no? No, I, I just. Uh, It was all an accident, I think. I played piano at the time, too, just on my own. Uh, but uh, I, I just loved the guitar and rock and roll, I think, at that time. So You're basically self-taught. And uh, were your parents supportive uh, since, you know, they were musicians as well themselves uh, to your career and uh, to your you know, love for music? They were, I mean, uh, but there was times, you know, when I was getting older in high school and then my report card was bad, and they would say, oh, we're taking your guitar away. Or, oh, wow. oh, yeah, yeah, they were they were strict. So, uh, but I got through high school. <laughs> okay. And uh, I went right on the road. As soon as I turned 18, I was in a band on the road. So, um, they, they were more uh, influential and uh, supportive in the beginning, but later... They were, they were concerned I wouldn't go to college or all that, and I didn't. <laughs> But they didn't have any career or did not work in music they as didn't. you are doing now? No, they didn't. No. So they were, um, they were scared. They didn't understand, yeah. But okay. that's okay. <laughs> and did you discover rock and roll yourself, or it was through your dad, maybe uh, his record collection or so on? I think um, a, a little bit. I think my first uh, ro record was Elton John, Crocodile Rock. Okay. So that was like 1973 or something. But um, And then, you know, uh, just friends in my neighborhood would show me albums, you know, Kiss, Foghat, Led Zeppelin, Peter Frampton, all yeah. these people, you know. Um, which was the band that was the first real spark for you in rock and roll? It was probably, you know, Kiss. Yes. Then it was, uh, shortly after, was Leonard Skinner. And that one really stuck with me for quite a few years. And uh, after that, you know, it was, you know, the typical Zeppelin, Sabbath, ACDC, Van Halen, you know, all those.
and you yeah. I mean you pick all of them at the same time it was, was like a full immersion period with rock yeah and roll. with like within three years uh, everything yeah you know, I heard it all you know all the favorite the mainstream stuff but I remember uh, one particular day a, a, a guy played me a tape and he played me the song Sweet Home Alabama Leonard Skinner and then he played me ZZ Top Deguelo album so in one sitting I heard all that and I was oh my god <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's talk about uh, your guitar style. So, uh, first of all, the whammy bar and the slide are two main ingredients of your musical recipe, if you can, yeah. if we can call it like that, in a very peculiar way. So, it was uh, something that you discovered listening to somebody else, or it was, or it was just your. Uh, something that you developed yourself a little bit of both i mean the tremolo arm was a was a big deal back in the 80s i think a lot of guys were doing it but uh you know when i started doing it i i think i was imitating a sound that i really didn't know okay. you know but it, it existed in the 50s more i think chet atkins and people used it back then yeah. and that's kind of this imaginary sound more of a rockabilly uh, approach but um then you know it it just maybe a couple of years later i tried to you know develop that into my own style a little bit instead of just doing dive bomb you know like van halen and yeah. stuff like that and you have a very particular style emulating slide guitar with the tremolo yeah yeah mm, which is something that you develop maybe more than everybody else yeah you know i i started doing it because i couldn't play slide uh -huh. and i thought but still it sounded different than slide to me Um, and it, it's again, it, but it all goes back to the 50s with surf and, and uh, rockabilly. The way they used the tremolos back then was actually very similar. But I think just people forgot about that because when we went through the 60s and 70s and then 80s, people came back with the tremolo and they were going crazy with it. And I was kind of thinking, no, oh, but it's a, it's a more musical approach, you know. And can we also define your live Uh, your concert approach very 70s just as you know your influence and your music you know that was a magic era where you know shows and albums offered you know expanded and rearranged versions of songs and classics which were very different from uh, the album tracks is that the same approach you had yeah yeah and and also my my favorite thing to do live is just to say You know, what does this city want to hear? Okay. So what does this audience want to hear? If I'm opening up for an instrumental band, maybe I should play more instrumentals, or maybe not. Maybe play the opposite, because they're already going to play that. So I always try to sometimes design the set list for whatever is going to work that day. If it's a hard rock audience, yeah. then we got to play some more hard rock, you know. So, so that means that you have like a very long list of songs ready sometimes the, mm -hmm. luckily the, the list we have now has a little bit of everything and it's my tour so i get to play what i want on this tour but uh you know there are times where we'll go to a club and i'll go well these people don't really know me that well uh they just come to the club because it's in the town and a lot of the people just want to hear vocals and songs yeah. so they maybe not are into the instrumentals yeah. so we'll do more vocal songs And uh, that's the, the most important thing, I think, is to, you know, when there's just normal people, they're not musicians, they don't want to hear the musician stuff, they just want to hear rock and roll. Yeah. And so that's, I, I like to be able to just provide that if that's what they want to hear. So. Do you rehearse a lot with your band or you keep it, you know, spontaneous the most? Uh, oh, it's a, the, on, on stage, it's all spontaneous. We get, I think we rehearsed uh, twice and then uh, about, Two weeks before that, about three times. So it's it's uh, we're not playing all every week, rehearsing or anything like that. So, how many musicians do you have on three? Tour? Yeah, three. trio. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I'm doing vocals and guitar, and then Baron Cabois on bass and Chris Siepkin on the drums. Yeah. And what does it take to play with Michael Lee Ferkins? Well, you gotta be able to play rock, but then you have to want to experiment with uh, uh, other stuff, and maybe sometimes we'll shred. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, no, we're going to play real simple. And that's the key, is you have to be able to play simple, too. And what's your point of view about practice? You're uh, an artist that practice a lot when you're at home, or actually you have a different approach? I usually just, uh, 
when I pick up the guitar every day, I'm usually I'm gonna write a song right away. Okay. So I pick it up, I put record on the iPhone, and I usually write something. And, and it's uh, spontaneous, and I come up with it right away. And within 20 minutes, maybe I have a new song, and then I feel great about that. And so, but yeah, I mean, I've noticed I want to practice more lately. I want to I want to improve my techniques or stuff like that to where maybe the past 20 years, I didn't care about that. I just said, you know, I just want to be an artist. How I feel today, that's how I want it to be, yeah. you know, and... and but now I'm realizing the older I get, it gets harder and you want to keep your technique. So I'm trying to practice now a little bit. So you use the iPhone, which is a modern tool. So sometimes, you know, modern culture can help and it, it do, can be it positive. <laughs> yeah, because I can't remember the songs after I write them. I can't remember that I even did it. Yeah. So when I look back, I back up my iPhone, I go, wow, I, I <laughs> didn't remember any of these songs. And it's really weird, you know. But uh, I'll go, wow, I wrote something almost every day. And I'll listen, to, I'll thumb through it, and I'll go, I don't remember that at all. Right. And it's cool. It's cool to have it. Just it comes from a, a subconscious place, and, and it's done right away. <laughs> and how did you do it back in the days when you didn't have, you know, so... I, I didn't write songs very often. Oh, really? Yeah. I, every But, time I did a record, they would say, we want 10 songs on the record, and I'd always have, like, eight songs. And I never had the extra two, so it was always stressful to get the last two songs. But now I have, you know, a thousand songs, and uh, it's, it's kind of strange. So this is another reason why you're being very selective and recorded about its seven albums in, you know, 26 years, yeah, basically. Yeah. Okay, so you're very selective also because you don't remember stuff that you write, or uh, you're yeah. really hard with yourself. Yeah, a little, yeah, I am. <laughs> Both things. Uh, But lately, it's been easier to write songs, and now that I have a lot more backlog of songs, um, it makes me feel comfortable, and more songs always come every day still, but I have, you know, maybe 500 songs in, the, uh, in my... In work in progress. Yeah, that I could use if I needed to come up with an album quickly, you know, I could pick. Good. And um, so we, we just said that you are completely self-taught. Um, as a guitar teacher... Did the fact of being self-taught influence your approach to teaching? A little bit. I mean, I don't read music very well, but I can still draw out scales and things for people to uh, practice. And, you know, when I used to teach, kids would bring in their favorite song. They'd say, oh, I want to learn this song. And okay. so I would learn it for them. You know, I can just use my ear and learn it. And uh, that's most of them, that's what they, they want to do, you know. And then I'd give them a few scales to learn or something. And this is, for you, the correct approach? I mean, the fact, you know, of emulating something that you like that can bring, you know, your passion to music and also to technique? Is, that, yeah, is this I, the correct method? I think, yeah, if you, if you just teach kids uh, book stuff and they can't play their favorite songs, they're going to, yeah, they, they, they get bored. Mm. So they want immediately to be able to play their favorite song, even a little bit of it. And that's what they're most happy doing. So that's the best. Um, you played also in some cover bands in the early days, um, especially nowadays. There's the tendency, you know, to consider cover bands and tribute bands the worst enemy by bands that are trying to make it with their own original music. And that's yeah. because, you know, club owners usually hire, you know, cover bands because people prefer to hear music that they already know and like yeah, and yeah. so on. What's your opinion since you've been on both sides of the barricade starting in cover bands and then making a career, you know, yeah. with your own music? Well, I still play covers live quite a bit. Yeah. So we, we throw in maybe five covers a night. And, uh, but yeah, it, it's kind of weird when people dress up like other people. That's a difference than playing covers. So, you know, no one would have thought this would be happening so much in yeah. 2015, 16, you know. But, uh, you know, I think for the people doing it, it's probably fun. I mean, I love playing my favorite old songs. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's frustrating. You know, you go, you play a gig and not as many people are there. And then you look the next night and it's an ACDC tribute band. It's you know, a thousand people <laughs> sold out. It's kind of like, what, what world are we in? But uh, it's okay. I mean, there's nothing we're going to change about that. Um, but yeah, the club owners should probably support a little more original music. But 
I don't know. Very How is it in the States? Same it, thing oh, as in Europe? You know, way, you know. way more tribute bands really? than, than here. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It's almost exclusive, it seems like. But, you know, it's, it's just the way it is. It makes me proud to play originals. Mm-hmm. So I'm proud to just be doing my thing, and I'm happy about that. Another thing you've been involved in is the Dos, Dos Amigos. How do you pronounce that? Yeah, Dos Amigos. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which you teamed with Gabriel Moses. Uh, and actually, this duo was compared to Tenacious D. Uh, was that flattering, you know, to be compared to Jack Black and this band? Uh, and who actually came first with the idea? Them or... The Dos Amigos. Oh well, we're not we're 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 not really tenacious D. I mean, that's just uh, what what Dos Amigos is like. Cheech and Chong, Beavis and Butthead, Tenacious <laughs> D, uh, Laurel and Hardy. Uh, you could uh, come up with the the, the pairs, you know. Um, so I Tenacious D was the probably when we get funny, we have a little bit of comedy in our stuff. So maybe that's uh, a that's the comparison. Yeah, yeah. That's where it comes from. Yeah. Okay. And you've been also compared very often to another guitar god, which is Mr. Guthrie Govan. Uh, hmm. how, how do you live that? And uh, do you actually see any similarities yourself between you and him? I'm not sure. I mean, he, I met him once and he said he heard my first record, you know, 25 years ago. And he wow. said, thanks for putting that out, you know, and he, he was influenced by it a little bit. So I think that's where that comes from. But uh, I don't think most of his fans these days don't know who I am. So uh, I don't know how that works with all that. But he's, uh, you know, he's the main guy playing instrumental music right now for guitar. So uh, and he's he's making a lot of people interested in guitar again. Mm. And I think that's a great thing. I mean, and maybe they'll find out who I am through him. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um. From your first uh, eponymous album till Yep, which is from 2013, how much has your style developed at your own ears? When you listen back, you know, to early stuff and compared to what you're doing now. I think it's very different. Uh, I I could do an instrumental album now and try to make it sound like the first one if I wanted, but I, you know, I'd try to fight that. I think uh, I like to just naturally develop and... Sometimes you mature into something that isn't popular, Mm. you know, like sometimes I'll write a very deep song and my friend will say, you know, well, but that's most people think that's just campfire music. You know what I mean? They're they're not excited about three chord Bob Dylan song, you know, (laughs) and uh, but I am. So uh, that makes me happy. But I do understand sometimes you have to. Um, use your talent. So if I'm good at something that people enjoy, maybe I need to do that too, you know? Yeah. So it's kind of a, a fight of, you know, do you want to make money? Do you want to be popular? Do you want to be an artist? You know, yeah. and I usually pick being an artist. But these days I'm, I'm open-minded to doing an instrumental record and, uh, you know, as many things as I can do, you know? And when you listen back to those first records, uh, do you do you see them, you know, very far away from what you're now, or they're part, you know, of the same story? So people that are approaching you now should listen also to those. Yeah, records? they're still a part of the picture. I mean, we're playing four songs from my first record well, on so. this tour. So, and I enjoy trying to play those and and make them good and make something new in them. So. Uh, you know, it's definitely a part of the story, for sure. Um, when you listen back to the cover record, the composition, which was from 1999, do you still recognize those influences, or you're in another world now? Um, sometimes, uh, you talk about uh, decomposition. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes, uh, I, I, I think everyone goes, like, sometimes you'll go through your Led Zeppelin phase. You go, oh, and you go play Led Zeppelin in the basement with your friends, you know. And then you get into that, and then five years goes by, and you forget about it, and then mm-hmm. it comes back again. So I think that always will come back, these influences, but you do need to take a break and find new ones okay. sometimes, yeah. So if you, if you had to record another cover album, would be completely different now? Yeah, yeah, I, I've definitely... Um, I like a lot of, you know, whenever I can find a new song and I think, oh, I'd love to record that. That's always a great feeling. I heard a song by um, 
the blues artist Bobby Blue Bland mm -hmm. lately, and I thought it was great. And I would, so I, I have different ideas about how I would do covers now for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what's your feeling seeing you know the Hot Leaks video from '89? Did you ever watch it again? I never watched it the first really? time. Oh, <laughs> just the first. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. I just flew to New York, filmed it. Uh, was it? Never watched it. Uh, then I think when the internet came out, it was on the, the internet. And I think like one time I accidentally saw it. <gasps> you know, was shocked and scared and erased it. You know, uh, so I've never seen it, but uh, I remember. You know, mm. I remember what I did in it. I think that was an exciting period, by the way. Oh yeah, yeah. I loved it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, all those all those things were new and fresh. And all those videos and it was great. Were you ever approached, but by any big band that wanted, you know, to have you in the lineup and said no, or it actually never happened? I don't remember it ever happening. Mm. I'm trying to think. Uh, there might be a few people, but they were they were not famous anymore. Like maybe they were famous at one time, okay. and then by the time they came to me, they weren't famous anymore. Okay. <laughs> Happens so. to a lot of friends of mine. Yeah, yeah. You know, like big stars, you know, well after they're done, will come and, hey, you know, I want you to play. And uh, one of my friends once said, oh, well, send me a tape okay. <laughs> to a really big famous person. <laughs> must be tough. you know, you had the looks. You, you were an amazing musician. So, you know, I mean... Uh, even now, you know, if any band like, I don't know, Guns N' Roses would call you, would you accept or you have uh, a different vision? Uh, totally I'm, different. Oh, well, I tried out for Guns N' Roses when they uh, were looking for a guitar player. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. so you did. Yeah, okay. yeah, this was probably seven, eight years ago. Wow. Um, and I, I was probably down to the top three guys. Um, wow. Wow. But, you know, I went there and I saw, you know, Axel wasn't even there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you are pretty much paid a lot of money to rehearse all day without Axel. Wow. So I thought, <laughs> that's not what I want to do. Okay. <laughs> but but uh, I, I have no interest in being in big bands anymore. I'm really happy to do my little shows. And it makes me very happy just to do that. And concerning your gear, uh, how did it change since, you know, the Gibson SG and Fender Princeton Reverb Amp from, you know, 79 to now. Uh, very, I mean, you change a lot of instruments and amps or basically you're sticked to be, you know, something that was uh, comfortable for you. Yeah, um, I, I have all, I have probably 30 guitars, so I have all the different food groups. I have the Gibson SG and uh, Strat, Tele, yeah. Gretsch. So at home, I play all of them. And okay. there's not a favorite at all. Oh. It's, it's more about when I play live, I have to have something that can do the most songs. So, but I love uh, uh, SG still when I have one. And uh, The I original love, one? Uh, no, I don't have that one. I sold it. And I oh. wish I never would have. Yeah, bad, yeah. bad decision. <laughs> one regret. <laughs> oh, yeah. That is one regret. Yeah. <laughs> was that an old one? It w it was. Um, it wasn't a 60s one, but it was an early 70s. Oh, okay. yeah. But it, it just meant a lot to me. And uh, But at the time, I was you know interested in new gear, and I just thought, uh, and it wouldn't stay in tune at all. So... I got a guitar that stayed in tune. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Maybe the internet can help you to find it back. No, I know the, I know the guy. I already tried. Oh, but he, <laughs> so he someone painted it and then he <laughs> sold it somewhere. <laughs> okay. Um, in 97, you played the Jimi Hendrix Music Festival. Yeah. Um, he's still, in your opinion, the best of them all, uh, the biggest pioneers of all, among all pioneers, in your opinion. I think you could say that, yeah. I mean, I, I think there's other guys, too. I mean, but Jimi Hendrix, he made such a huge impact in the pop world. You know, there's other guys that were obscure that did J uh, Django Reinhardt and all these people, but uh, Hendrix just had such a big impact and sold a lot of records. Yeah. I mean, so I think that's, you'd have to say maybe, yeah, that he's the guy. And among the new musicians, new guitarists, is there any colleague that you're looking at and that you listen to and like, and which is your favorite at the moment? I haven't. I don't listen to much new stuff. Um, I usually 
you know, there's so much old music I still haven't studied. So I'm always looking back. I Django Reinhardt, I just feel like I'm just discovering him. And he was from 1940. So um, I'm usually looking back, trying to all the great music from the past still. And what about, you know, new bands like The Answer or Rival Songs or The Temperance Movement, which are very 70s in the approach and, and in the sound? Is something that you're into or? I am. I love I love making 70s rock. It's mm. just it's, it's one thing I like to do. I like to do instrumental and progressive. I like to do anything. But yeah, I still have a, a favorite of 70s rock and I probably one out of four songs I write is, is definitely a 70s yeah. rock. Yeah. Okay. Um, particular question now about Nebraska. Um, but Nebraska, not your country, but the Bruce Springsteen album, oh, uh, yeah. which, you know, always divided people and critics. And which is your point of view being from there on that album? Is something that you like or that sh well, you... I didn't really listen to Bruce when I was a kid, mm -hmm. but, I, but I'm familiar with that record now. And uh, Highway Patrolman is just a great song. I love that song. Um, and I've been pulled over by the police in Nebraska many times, so I can <laughs> relate to that song. But, uh, you know, Nebraska is a great place. Um, it's a perfect place. I would never change growing up there. You know, it's a really uh, uh, normal place. Um, it's not East Coast. It's not West Coast. The yeah. people are very uh, honest. And uh, I I wish I could live there now. I live in California now. Yeah. But uh, it's it's a really great place to, to grow up and, and uh, experience childhood. And did it influence that environment? I mean, influenced your oh, yeah. your style oh, and yeah. your music? Yeah, because and yeah, it was such a rock and roll town, too. I mean, all the big tours started in Omaha. Okay. Their first show was in Omaha. Really? And Yeah. And uh, I just remember going to all those concerts. And uh, I, I went to my first concert in 1976. I saw Kiss. I saw Alice Cooper. I saw The Cars. Um, I saw the babies uh, wow. open up for all these bands many times, and uh, it's definitely a rock and roll town for sure. Why there? It was the perfect warm up city. I think so. Yeah, they <laughs> used that, and so we and we didn't even know at the time when you're a kid, you don't know that's the first show. Yeah, but uh, uh, it was almost all those bands started there. It was very cool. So Pat Travers, Neil Zaza, Jason Baker, and Steve Hunter are all musicians that you had very particular collaborations with. Yeah. Uh, which is the best memory that you treasure among all of this? And is there any guitarist you love to collaborate with which you still didn't? Um, well, Jason Becker, the sessions we did were just amazing. I mean, he was still able to speak at that time. Uh, pretty well so he was in a wheelchair but he could speak just fine so we uh, we spent 12 days working on this crazy long 15 minute song and uh, every time you know we take breaks and joke around and um, it was just a really special moment I think it was uh, it's almost well it's like 23 years ago I think was that time so uh, and that was a very hands-on session to where maybe uh, the other ones you talked about the we weren't even in the same room probably when we did the tracks you know people send the files to you now you know so but jason we were together the whole time and it was very special in situations like that when you you know two musicians like you and jason in the same room are working together is more a matter of competition or it's more a matter you know of giving and taking the best from each other yeah just trying to trying to help the person get what they want you know so jason was very descriptive he would say you know i want you to play this note i want you to squeal it like this i want it to be up oh, it's it's out of tune i want you to play that in tune you know he was very descriptive of how he wanted it to where some people aren't they they just sit there and they're they don't like what you're doing and they won't tell you and then <laughs> then you leave and then they you know you oh, he doesn't want it <laughs> so you know and that's no good and 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 i don't like to send files to people and have them record it because it never works you know if you're in the same room it always you could just say one thing and it makes the whole difference you know so you're on tour right now in europe uh you've done belgium germany now you're in italy then you'll be in france Uh, then you go back to the States and uh, yeah. for more shows. So what would you say to invite people over 
at your new live show in the town near them? Which is your perfect invitation to come? Well, we're going to be playing old songs, which some people know from my early records. But also, you know, uh, I'm 48 years old and I want to kick ass. And that's why I'm doing this. It's not for the money. It's not for anything, but I want to be better. And so when we play every night, we are, that's all we want to do. That's why we're on the road. And uh, we play covers when we feel that it's necessary. But we really, I feel like I'm better now than I've ever been. And uh, I keep working on the vocals and the instrumental. And when we get to play every night, you can tell every night we're getting better. Mm. So, Are you recording any material for a live album or something like that? Or is something that you're not interested in? Not yet, but I, I think eventually I will have to do that. Uh, but when I do, I'm going to do it in a recording studio mm. with cameras and record it like really pro in the studio like that. I think that'd be one of the best ways to do it. Um, but, uh, we do try out some new material live. We have, a, a some new songs where we try out and it's pretty fun. Is this an idea or it's in the plans actually to do a live in the studio? Uh, well, that's just where, I think that's where everything's headed mm -hmm. because everyone wants a video. Yeah. So, and when you're at a club, it's usually, uh, the video isn't so great and you have to hire people to show up. But yeah. I think uh, there's more and more studios that have cameras ready to go. And of course, they have the recording equipment. But it's something yeah. that you're working already on. You see no, the plans, no, I, not I, yet. I just know that that's where the one of the next things I'm going to do. I won't necessarily do a whole record. I'll just do a song, and put that out on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And is there what's immediate? You know, in the next plans for you? Well, I have so many songs, so I'm just trying to decide whether I should do an album or if I should just release singles all the time okay because i think uh, i've noticed a lot of people when they put out a record there's all this promotion around the release date and it's gone in two weeks yeah. two weeks later it disappears so i think if you do a song every month i think that would be better than putting out a record and you put the record out at the end of the year with all the songs that you've done so i might try that approach that's very smart <laughs> yeah i think plus you can make videos of some of those songs if not all of them Yeah. I just think it's the, a better way these days. You know, you're not wasting two, three years of, you know, in a studio, upset, trying to make some <laughs> masterpiece, you know. <laughs> just make a song, record a song and put it out, you know. Last question for today, which yeah. is the best record that you've done that is, you know, uh, the best way to start to approach Michael Lee Ferkins? Well, if you just want to hear guitar, then that's my first record, I would okay. say. But if you just want to hear songs, that's my last record. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. the first and the last one, yeah, which yeah, yeah. makes a sense yeah, of yeah. this journey. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much for your time and for this interview. Yeah, you're and welcome. Thanks for having me. Hope to have you soon back to Italy. Yeah, and next year. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thank rock you. Rock on, man. Yeah, rock on. <laughs>